In this lesson and the one that follows, we're going to be focusing on the macroeconomic objective of low and stable inflation. We'll start with the definition, and we'll look at how the inflation rate is calculated in most countries, and we'll move on to the different causes of inflation, during which we'll do a graphical analysis using an aggregate demand, aggregate supply model of the different types of inflation. In the next video, we'll talk about some of the consequences of inflation and the solutions to inflation using different macroeconomic policies. We'll start with the definition of inflation. You may already know this, but inflation has a very simple definition. It is defined as an increase in the average price level of goods and services in a nation over time. Quite simple. Inflation is when prices are rising. Now let's distinguish between inflation and the microeconomic concept of an increase in the price. In microeconomics, you might have talked about the market for a particular good, such as fuel for cars or laptop computers. An increase in the price of fuel or laptops is not inflation. The microeconomic concept of increases in price or decreases in price applies only to markets for particular goods. To distinguish inflation from the microeconomic concept of higher prices, inflation refers to the average price level of all goods and services. So that raises the question, how is inflation calculated? It's pretty easy to tell if the price of a particular good like laptop computers is rising or falling. But to measure inflation, we must have some sort of index of all prices in a country. And what economists use at most national levels is what's called the consumer price index. Now in another video, I'll go into more detail about how inflation is calculated, but I want to give a quick snapshot here. The CPI is basically a basket of goods purchased by the typical consumer in a nation. It might include thousands of different goods ranging from things like electricity to cell phone service to restaurant meals to laptop computers and other goods, fuel for automobiles. It adds up the price of all these goods, puts it into one giant basket, and determines if the price of that basket of goods rises or falls over time. So the CPI can be measured for a particular year. And to find inflation, so I'll write this here. Um, the CPI measures the price of a basket of goods for a particular year and divides by the price of the same basket in a base year. What we end up with is an index representing whether prices have increased or decreased from a base year. Once the CPI has been determined for a particular year, the inflation rate can be found by finding the rate of change in the CPI between the year in question, I'll call that year two, and the previous year, call that year one, and defining the change in the CPI by the previous year's CPI. In other words, we find the rate of change in the CPI. Multiply this by 100, and what we get is a percentage that represents the inflation rate. Again, there's another lesson in which there is more demonstration of how inflation is calculated. I wanted to review that here before we move on to the different causes of inflation. So we're going to look at a graph to distinguish between the two different types of inflation that a country might experience. Of course, we'll be using our standard aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph, which has price level on the vertical axis and real GDP on the horizontal axis. We'll put our long run aggregate supply curve vertical at the full employment level of output call that LRAS. We'll do a short run aggregate supply curve representing the Keynesian view of the economy and we'll assume that this economy begins at full employment. In other words the equilibrium level of output the intersection of AD and AS is at the full employment level. We'll also assume of course that at full employment there is a low and stable rate of inflation which corresponds to the price level of PLE. Now, when an economy is in equilibrium, there are only two things that can cause inflation to increase, and that's either an increase in aggregate demand or a decrease in aggregate supply. Let's look at demand pull inflation first. Let's define it down here, and then we'll illustrate how it looks on our graph. Demand pull inflation occurs when there is an increase in either C, I, G, or XN, which, as you should now know, stand for consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports, without a corresponding increase in the aggregate supply. 
In other words, if aggregate demand shifts out, but there is no increase in aggregate supply, we'll expect to see price levels rise in the economy. Let's show that on a graph here. Assume that due to an increase in foreign incomes, there is an increase in net exports for the nation. So aggregate demand shifts out to AD1. Now, ceteris paribus, an increase in net exports does nothing to increase the potential output of the nation. It doesn't increase the productivity of workers. It doesn't increase the quality of technology or capital goods in the nation. All it does is creates more demand for the nation's goods and services. So as we can see, there is a movement along the short-run aggregate supply curve, causing a short-run increase in output to a level beyond full employment. I'll call this Y1. But due to the increasing scarcity of resources and the increased demand for the output produced in the nation, there is inflation. We see price levels rise to PL1, and this is what we call demand pull inflation. Very simple. Demand increases for the nation's output of goods and services, but the output of goods and services cannot increase at the same rate as demand. This is equivalent to a microeconomic scenario in which demand for automobile fuel increases, but the supply stays the same. So we see an increase in quantity supplied, but an increase in the price as well. In macroeconomics, an increase in demand without a corresponding increase in aggregate supply causes demand pull inflation. So that's one scenario, one cause of inflation in a nation's economy. Another cause of inflation is what we call cost push inflation. Now, this doesn't sound quite as obvious as demand pull because there's not a line on the graph called the cost curve. However, there is the aggregate supply curve. And when costs of production increase in a nation, this could be energy prices, raw material costs, labor prices, in other words, wages. If any of these costs increase, then SRAS, the short-run aggregate supply, decreases, causing price levels to rise, and the quantity of output demanded to decrease. So we can show cost push inflation on a graph by assuming that one of the major resource costs, such as energy prices, were to go up. If energy prices were to rise, then all producers of all goods and services would see their cost of production increase. This would cause aggregate supply in the short run to decrease or shift to the left. We would actually see a decrease in aggregate supply, which we'll look at our original AD curve here of AD. We move along the aggregate demand curve to a lower level of output demanded. I'll call this Y2, and we have a higher average price level. I'll call this PL2. So our green shift here, it's getting a little bit cluttered on our graph. Maybe I can erase the AD. Let's show that again. Rising costs cause a shift of aggregate supply, short run aggregate supply to the left. And in the short run output falls to Y2 and price levels rise to P2, PL2. This is cost push inflation. Rising costs of production have increased the average price level to PL2 and at the same time output has actually fallen. So one of the main differences as you can see between cost push and demand pull inflation is that when there's demand pull inflation there's actually a short run increase in national output. However in the case of cost push inflation there is a short run decrease in national output. So if we had to compare and contrast cost push inflation and demand pull inflation, one of the differences is that cost push inflation usually leads to what we call stagflation. Now this is a fancy word for saying stagnant economic growth. In other words, growth has fallen to zero or maybe even negative and inflation. Stagflation is another word for cost push inflation actually. Anything that causes short and aggregate supply to decrease will cause the economy to stagnate and cause inflation. In contrast, an increase in aggregate demand causes short-run economic growth and inflation.
So what happens in the long run as a result of both cost push and demand pull inflation? As we've shown in previous lessons, an economy experiencing demand pull inflation, assuming nothing is done to reduce the level of aggregate demand, will correct itself as wages adjust to the higher price level and output returns to its full employment level. In the case of cost push inflation, there's no simple solution here. There's not even a good theoretical explanation of how an economy will self-correct from cost push inflation. All we can hope is that the costs of production, whether it's energy prices or wages, will eventually decrease again and output can return to its full employment level. So graphically, we can assume that this unemployment resulting from cost push inflation, so we know that unemployment increases when output falls, this could, in the long run, lead to falling wages, which would allow an economy to self-correct from cost push inflation. If wages adjust to the lower level of employment, then it's conceivable that output will simply return to the full employment level, will move back along our AD curve. So in this first part of the lesson, we have defined inflation. We've shown how it's calculated using a statistical tool called the Consumer Price Index. And we've distinguished between demand pull and cost push inflation. Graphically, these are shown as either an outward shift of aggregate demand and a movement along the SRAS curve, or an inward shift of aggregate supply and a movement along the aggregate demand curve. In the next video, we'll talk about some of the consequences of inflation, the winners and losers, and we'll talk about the different solutions the government has to try to reduce the inflation rate. Here we go. One step back.